Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace." Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I've made, very good. But if you will not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire even killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, 
Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Let's, um, let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you that we have the freedom to gather here this morning and uh, hear your word read to us. And um, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us uh, in these few moments together. In Jesus' name and to Jesus' glory. Amen. Uh, I want to thank you for the invitation to come here this morning. Thank you for uh, your hospitality I've received so far. Uh, yet me and Mike know each other. We've known each other for years. Um, he was my best man as well. It wasn't just one way. And um, I don't have any stories. What can I say? Who's a pretty pr- clean living guy. So um, apologies, apologies for that. Um, but it really is a pleasure um, to be with you this morning. Um, I worked for Open Doors before I took on this role two years ago. Um, I was a vicar in the Church of England. Uh, I was a vicar for um, 20 years. Uh, some of that time I was overseas. I was in the Philippines as a missionary. And uh, before that, I did some uh, Christian youth work. Uh, me and Mike were um, both young people in a, a church, which was just a kind of sleepy uh, Methodist church, really. And then God's Spirit moved on that church, and it began to grow, and lots of young people uh, became Christians, and it was a wonderful time. And now as I, as I look back and I travel around the country, uh, I meet people who are in that youth fellowship, and we didn't all become vicars, um, but it feels like most of us did at one time or another. Um, so I'm very grateful uh, to God for Mike and uh, his friendship. If you don't know about Open Doors, very briefly, we are a uh, Christian mission uh, organization, and we are committed to standing with and supporting uh, the persecuted church. Um, Around the world, around one in seven of our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, live in contexts where they suffer either persecution or certainly extreme discrimination uh, for their faith in Christ. One in seven of our Christian family. If you do the math, that's around 365 million people, one million people uh, for every day of the year. Uh, And that persecution looks different in different uh, contexts. I'm going to share um, some stories of the challenges that our brothers and sisters um, in Christ uh, are facing. If you want to know more about the ministry, um, I commend this book to you. Um, It's called God's Smuggler by Brother Andrew. Our founder is a man called Brother Andrew. And he began his ministry as a young man, 26, um, smuggling Bibles into what was then known as communist Europe uh, behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, we've continued that ministry till till today. Um, It's broadened out our ministry. Our focus has broadened out, but we still are committed to standing with and supporting our persecuted family. And in some places, that means smuggling Bibles. In some places, that means providing trauma care. Uh, In some places, that means providing safe houses. Um, Whatever our brothers and sisters uh, need, we will uh, step up and help uh, to support them. Uh, If you'd like a copy of this book, it's free. Come and see me um, at the end of the service. We're in Daniel chapter 3 this morning. And I want to remind you, remind us of three things. Firstly, there is only one God who is worthy of our worship. There's one God who's worthy of our worship. Secondly, we can trust in that God, no matter what. And thirdly, that the Lord will stand with us in the fire. Firstly, there is only one God who is worthy of our worship. Uh, Just to remind us of the context of our reading this morning, 
Uh, we're going back in time. It's around 585 BC. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the great Babylonian uh, empire, the superpower of its day. Uh, he's conquered Jerusalem around 20 years earlier, and he's taken into captivity uh, the young men, the nobles of the king's court of uh, uh, Judah. These men are Daniel and his three friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In chapter 3, they're no longer um, teenagers, but they're young men, and they've had uh, 20 years of living in the Babylonian court. They've been taught a new language. Uh, they've been given new food. Their names have been changed. Uh, they suffered uh, cultural indoctrination. Uh, they've been taken as good Jewish boys, and they're forced to become uh, good Babylonian young men. Babylon is the center of the Babylonian Empire. It's the seat of the king's power. It's a cultural hub. And in the Bible, it's the archetype of uh, excess. The Babylonian kingdom stands for everything that God's kingdom does not. But these three boys, these teenagers become young men, they refuse to compromise and they make a stand. Here in chapter 3, we see that they're still standing. In fact, they're the only ones standing. Nebuchadnezzar has ordered a great statue uh, to be uh, built on the plain. He's gathered the dignitaries from uh, across the empire, the countries that he has conquered. He's got the great and the good of Babylonian society together. And they're all lined up in front of each other, in front of the king. And he's built a great statue, a graven image. We're not told what the statue is of, but the assumption is that it's of Nebuchadnezzar himself. We're given its dimensions. It's 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. That's about 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. It's about the size of six and a half double-deckers stacked one on top of the other. It will be a formidable sight. It's made of gold. And when the, the statue is unveiled, it will blaze in the sun on the plain. It will be seen for miles and miles around. And it will speak of Nebuchadnezzar's might and his glory and his power. And he orders that people will bow down and worship before it. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refuse. They refuse to bow before this image of the king. Why? Because only God alone, the God of heaven and earth, is worthy of our worship. In our world today, dictators are still building monuments to their glory. And they're still instructing people to bow down before them. Every year in Open Doors, we produce uh, this resource. It's called the World Watch List. It's a guide to the 50 countries where it's most difficult, most dangerous uh, to follow Jesus. We rank them in order, uh, the, the most difficult, dangerous place being number one. And again, uh, this year, as in so many years, number one is North Korea. North Korea has been called a country which is also a prison camp. It's the home of six, 26 million people. Most of them live in abject poverty. And in Pyongyang, the capital, you'll find bronze statues at 72 feet high. You see a photo there on our screen. Statues of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, the former leaders. And people queue up for hours under the gaze of the soldiers to bow before these statues. The leaders of North Korea are to be worshipped as gods. But there's only one God that is worship, worthy of worship. And there are people who will not bow, even in North Korea. This year I had the privilege of meeting a lady called Kim sang -wa. And uh, she lives in South Korea, but she was born in North Korea. 
Um, as a young girl, she became a Christian when she was uh, 12 years old. And her story, her testimony is that she found a Bible that was hidden uh, in her house. And when she found the Bible, she was immediately conflicted uh, because she knew this was a forbidden book. This was a, a banned book. Uh, Kim sang told me that when you're a child in North Korea, when you go to school, you learn three things. As a young child at infant school, you learn uh, reading, you learn writing, and you learn spying. And you're told if you, if you find anything unusual, anything suspicious, any strange books in your house, you're to tell your teacher. If your parents are ever talking about anything to do with God or gods or prayer or worship, you're to tell your teacher. The teacher will tell the authorities and then the soldiers, the secret police, will come and visit your house and you won't see your parents again. So Kim sang found this a Bible in a house and at 12 years old, she was for two weeks conflicted. Should she tell her teacher or should she tell her father that she'd found his secret book and she told her father? Her father was shocked and then he took her outside and he showed her the, the mountains and the stream and the forest. And he said, who do you think made these things? She never thought about that question before. And he began to tell her about God. And he said to her, what's the most thing that you're most scared of in all of the, the forest and the woods around us? And he said, the, the snake. And he said, well, there's a dangerous snake in the Bible too. And he explained the story of creation and the story of sin and the, the story of redemption. And he led his 12-year-old daughter uh, to Christ. He told her that his father had been a Christian and his grandfather had been a Christian. And they, they had led a secret church for generations in North Korea. And they had a single Bible that they passed down from father to son, father to son. And that was the Bible uh, that she had found. And she joined the secret church um, that he led. Kim sang said this to me. She later escaped from North Korea, is now in South Korea uh, with her husband who's also a Christian. They lead a church for uh, North Koreans who've escaped uh, North Korea, now live in South Korea, and uh, they pastor a church for uh, those Christians together. And she said this to me. When the soldiers discover that you're a Christian... Uh, they drag you out into the street and they give you an ultimatum. And they say, will you choose your God and die? Or will you choose the Kim family and live? The Kim family is the ruling dynasty of North Korea. And you can imagine what happens if you choose God. If you choose God, you will die. If you choose the Kim family, you will live. And yet God is at work even in North Korea. In this country of 26 million people, we estimate there are around 400,000 Christians. Secret networks, secret churches, meeting in the woods and in hidden rooms. Praying and worshipping together in whispers lest their neighbours overhear them. Open Doors field workers are supporting around 100,000 North Koreans who've escaped into China, who are uh, illegal uh, immigrants within China, living in fear that if they're discovered, they'll be sent back across uh, the border and uh, sent to a prison camp or worse. Secret underground churches of North Koreans meeting in secret in China, in safe houses that we help uh, to provide. And the testimony of these secret believers in North Korea and in China and around the world is that the God who alone is worthy of our worship can be trusted. That he can be trusted no matter what. This is my second point. We can trust in this God who is worthy of our worship no matter what. I love the faith of these three young men. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, 
the God we serve is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. God is able to deliver his people. God will deliver his people. But even if he does not, his people will not worship a false god. I want to bring this home to us uh, this morning for a moment. Uh, I don't know what trials you're facing. Uh, trials at home, trials at work, trials at university. I do know that Jesus said, uh, no servant is greater than his master. And if they persecute me, they will persecute you also. I do know that God is able to deliver us from our enemies, whatever form they may take. And even if we do not see that deliverance straight away, let us remain faithful and not bow before the false gods that are set before us. I want to share with you this morning a story uh, from Yemen. Yemen is in the news at the moment. It's the uh, country on the Arabian Peninsula where uh, there is a Houthi uh, militia waging a, a civil war against the Yemeni uh, authorities, uh, backed by um, Iran. It's the Houthi militia who are uh, firing rockets at, sea, at uh, ships in the Red Sea. Following Jesus in Yemen is extremely dangerous. Uh, conversion from Islam is uh, forbidden by Islamic and by state law. Uh, Christians must keep their faith secret or they risk severe persecution from their families, uh, from their communities, uh, from the armed militias, from the government, from radical Islamic groups. If you're a, a woman... In Yemen, who becomes a Christian, your husband almost certainly will divorce you if he uh, doesn't become a Christian. You will lose custody of your children. Uh, you'll face arrest, inter interrogation, or even honor killings. If you're a man who um, becomes a Christian, you'll almost certainly be arrested. You'll certainly be beaten. You may even be killed. Pastors and church leaders are uh, particularly um, at risk of imprisonment and torture. We're going to see the testimony now of a, an underground church leader in Yemen, a leader called Salah, and his witness uh, to God's deliverance. My name is found on the radicals wanted list. They have my picture. Sometimes they watch me going from place to place. Usually I'm bombarded by threats. But all this won't stop my ministry. The more I receive threats, the more I am eager to serve. In Yemen, Christian converts like Saleh risk arrest, beatings, and death threats when they choose to follow Jesus. Despite all this, Saleh and his brother decided to start a house church for secret believers. Fear dwells among the Christians in Yemen, for there are people that come to church with no intent of pursuing the faith, but instead spying and collecting information on us. We are very careful about the meetings. We gather in closed spaces to prevent outsiders from hearing us. We had new believers in need of training and baptizing. So my brothers and I sat down to take a decision. They eventually decided that I should not accompany them because I was known. I posed a bigger risk to them. When they finished the training, they decided to move to another location for baptizing. 
So they took a bus and started on the journey. They were texting me for a while, but after that, I lost contact with them. Salah was terrified about what might have happened to his brother and friend. That evening, he received information that they had been captured and imprisoned. I was sad. I was crying. I felt guilty because I had allowed them to go to that place. My family was scared for me. They told me to flee the country. A lot of thoughts ran through my head. Should I stay or leave? I decided to hide in my home. During this time, I encouraged the rest of the brothers in my church. I would go secretly to meet them and pray with them, then return home into hiding. I would always remind them that when we decided to follow Christ, we were aware that things like this would happen. After several months, Salah's brother and friend were miraculously released from prison. Through their witness, several other prisoners had come to faith in Jesus. Yemen needs brave servants to go out in society and proclaim the message of God. I could stay safe. I could remain at home and face no persecution. But what good is my Christianity for them? What good is my faith if I don't go out and deliver the message of God to others? Your prayers are crucial to us because they lead to miracles. Salah now lives outside Yemen, but he still travels back to meet and disciple believers. And he's currently serving over 70 Christian uh, families in that uh, land, and Open Doors is supporting him as he supports that. There's only one God who is worthy of our worship. He will deliver us. And the God who will deliver us is the one who stands with us in the fire. You might be asking yourself this morning, where is Jesus in this uh, passage? I believe he's here in the story, and he's here with the three friends in the fire. Verse 25, he, that's King Nebuchadnezzar, said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. At the end of the story, he says, I I believe I saw uh, an angel with the three men in the fire. Scholars are divided on this. Some believe it was an angel. Some believe it was the second person of the the Trinity, the Word, who will be made flesh, uh, joining with uh, the three friends in the furnace. I believe it was Emmanuel. God with us in the furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This story reminds us that God is never far from any of us. Whether we live in Sheffield or Yemen or Iran or Bangladesh or wherever it might be around the world. God is present with his people in distress. In the worst of trials, in the midst of the fire of persecution. He's with us wherever we are and whatever we're going through. During Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's greatest trial, Jesus comes and accompanies them through it. He's the embodiment of the God who stands with us in the fire. We see here a literal fulfillment of Isaiah 43 verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Jesus is present with his people in their moment of distress. I want to encourage you this morning that whatever challenges you may be facing, Jesus is with you. 
Perhaps you can't see him. Perhaps you choose not to see him. But he is still Emmanuel, God with us. We're going to watch another testimony now. This is the story of uh, Pastor Zachariah. Uh, One of the regions that we're concerned about in Open Doors at the moment is uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly uh, Nigeria. You may have seen stories in the news of what's happening uh, to Christians there. Uh, Pastor Zachariah is a man who has suffered much and yet also found healing in the furnace of persecution. It was May 2023. Pastor Zachariah had been away from home and was returning to his village in Mangu, central Nigeria. Unaware of a devastating attack that had taken place, he started noticing people fleeing in the opposite direction. Most of them were barefoot. Their bodies were covered with mud because they'd had to crawl to escape the attack. The closer I got to my house, the more I saw people with injuries and dead bodies beside the road. My house was completely burned down, including everything inside. I looked around the house to see if I could find my wife and son, but I couldn't find them. Finally, I checked all the rooms inside my house and found their dead bodies in the kitchen area. The attack on Pastor Zachariah's village was one of several in the region that killed 125 people in a single week. The Fulani militants didn't explain why they targeted the mostly Christian communities. My opinion of why we were attacked is that it was their wish for us to be converted to Islam. And they hoped that by chasing us away, they would have more space to graze their cattle. When it happened, I felt like God had forsaken me. I began to think, if he's the true God, then why did he allow them to attack us? Where was he? Where was God? Why did he not take action? Open Doors partners invited Pastor Zachariah and other survivors to spend time at their trauma center. There he could find relief from the many questions weighing on his mind. Truly, if I hadn't come for this training, I think that life would have been very hard for me. Because in the months before I went for the training, I couldn't sleep. My thoughts kept going back to the attacks. But after receiving the trauma care, my mind is at rest. This teaching really has encouraged me. And they also taught us to forgive those who attacked us. I want to tell people who find themselves in situations like we've experienced, my prayer for you is that we should rely on God because he is everything we live for. These are heavy stories this morning, but let us be encouraged. There is only one God who is worthy of our worship. He can be trusted no matter what we face, and he is with us in the fire. After our service this morning, I'll be at the back. I've brought some resources with me. particularly want to commend the World Watch List. If you'd like to find out more about our persecuted family and pray with them and pray for them, uh, come and see me about getting one of these. But we're going to spend a few moments in prayer now. I'd like to encourage you, just where you're sat, just to get in twos and threes and to pray. Uh, Let's pray for the church in North Korea, that they would continue to stand strong. Let's pray for Pastor Salah and others like him ministering in Yemen. And let's pray for the church in Nigeria, that they would continue to witness in the presence of their enemies to the one we know as the Prince of Peace. Let's pray.